African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. A look at the beautiful kudus at the moment they are all just trying to investigate about what is happening in the surrounding what a lovely afternoon and most of all welcome to the beginning of the afternoon safari this is sydney pumulani mikosi and i'm traveling with senzo who is my camera operator this afternoon we are going to try by all means and look for some cats this afternoon as this morning it was very much difficult by this side of the western side of the greater kruger national park juma game reserve this is an interactive live safari you can follow us on twitter hashtag safari live you can also follow us on youtube chat stream So these kudus, uh, I can see that they are feeding on something there on the ground. I just want to check nicely. Maybe they must be doing this behavior of eating some old bones. Now they're just feeding on some of the uh, small trees there. I can see that they are not specifically feeding on any of the bones. You can see they are right there. One of them, that is the female. The male kudus, they have got horns. The female kudus, they don't have horns. And these males have got very beautiful spiral horns. Kudus, males are one of the best good looking males in the wild. These animals are so very huge, unbelievable same animal huge like this can be able to jump four meters high fence sometimes standing from a jumping from a standing position so now let's quickly uh, cross over to david in the masai mara who is also about to start looking for some animals this afternoon A very good afternoon everyone and welcome to the Mara Triangle. You were just with Sydney in South Africa but now you have come to a different country because I want for us to show you a bird that is flying, it has gone, it has gone, it has gone. But anyhow, it was a bird that I call the Lilac Breasted Roller, which is my favorite bird. My name is David and with me today is uh, Bungay Bungay, good afternoon. Welcome and Sydney said questions, comments are more than welcome. Please feel free to talk to us on hashtag Safari Live. And just like Sydney, I'm also planning to go looking for lions this afternoon. I am going to look at the whole of this area and make sure before long we'll be having some lions with us. That sounds good. Well, beautiful day here, beautiful afternoon, not very hot, clouds are lying a bit low, greyish, nothing scary, nothing to give us any rain, but hopefully we're going to have a wonderful time all of us. Well, apart from Sydney and myself, the gentleman, we be happy to say hello to all of you too. Well, good afternoon everybody and uh, hopefully what will lead to a very exciting start to our day. It's not very often that you'll see me out of the vehicle so early in the drive and there's a very good reason for why I'm out here. But before we get into it, my name is Tristan on camera, I've got to David this afternoon and it is a good welcome to Juma because here in the sand is something that we see very, very little of and it's right in the center part of Juma. We are on the western side of quarantine at the moment and at the back here you'll notice that there's sort of lobe shape that's happened and there's one two three four toes with claws on the front and so for those of you that are a little bit kind of knowledgeable about your tracks this is for a cheetah so there is a cheetah somewhere on juma that has come through looks like sort of towards the end of the rain last night and has walked around here during the course of the day it's very very badly obscured and a lot of vehicles have driven over it but for sure it's a cheetah track which is incredibly interesting because there's well not been many cheetahs seen on juma for quite some time it looks like it a female track it doesn't look like or a very young male but like I say the disturbance there is huge from the rain so it's going to be interesting to check if this cheetah is still around it might have gone all the way through and crossed up we're going to certainly have a really good scour of this area and see if maybe just maybe 
we get lucky with a, a cheetah somewhere on Juma. Wouldn't that be a spectacular way to have a Sunday afternoon drive? I think so. So we're going to try very hard to see where this cheetah goes. I want to probably check the sort of western side. Um, there's a lot more open sections and areas that are not bad for cheetah as opposed to the more the sort of southeast. The southeast becomes a lot more kind of leopardy in its environment. There's a lot more kind of thickets and um, drainage lines whereas this western portion has a few more clearings and openings that will be conducive for cheetah to move around. The problem is is that there's vehicles that have driven down this road during the course of the day today or during the morning drive and that's going to make it very tricky to be able to pick up where these this cheetah has walked. Um, I at first wasn't sure um, if it was a cheetah when I first saw the track. I kind of ummed and awed about it for quite a while but one of the other guys that I spoke to, one of the landowners, he uh, saw the tracks actually this morning and he said to me there was definitely cheetah tracks that he saw them in the soft sand before they drove over them. So um, it's good news in many respects um, that there is a cheetah kind of hanging around. But what I'm going to do is I'm not going to do quarantine just yet. I'm going to go around and do a little loop around and then we'll come back to quarantine just now. I just want to check if it didn't go down towards kind of Impala Plains because Impala Plains would be a good place for a cheetah to hang out. It's quite interesting that there is one moving around. There was tracks for one, I believe, on Biffles Hook, not yesterday, the day before, um, coming past um, a dam there and going towards sort of Torchwood. So I suppose it's very possible that this cheetah is angled from there onto this side and is then kind of moved along through here. Jamie says to me though, she had wild dog tracks on a very similar kind of trajectory. So there's lots of rare and endangered things that moved about during the course of the night last night, that's for sure. You can see where the guys have been turning around trying to see where they can find these tracks. Anyway, we're going to try and see what we can find, see if we get any signs of this cheetah further along the road. While we do that though, off to Jamie you go so she can say hello for the afternoon. If anyone can track down a cheetah resumer, Tristan can. I have utmost faith in his cat finding ability. A very good afternoon to all of you. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Craig is on camera with me. Also known of course as Batman, but don't tell anyone because it's something of a secret. So, as you may or may not have heard from various people, this morning was quiet on the cat slash dog slash hyena front. We didn't manage to find anything which is pretty typical for this time of year, especially after a nice big storm like that. So now, of course, the focus becomes trying to find something for the TV show this evening. So I'm going to meander along. My plan is, it was a bit, was a bit frustrating. Tingana was found yesterday evening just before the rehearsal, and then he vanished into a block, and um, the person who found him moved off, and I didn't get there in time to switch places and, and follow him. Now, we know where he disappeared to, but we also know that he didn't call last night. Now, for Tingana not to call at that sort of time of evening is unusual, which makes me think, hope, perhaps force of optimism here, that he has a kill in that direction. So that's where I'm heading this afternoon. I don't know why I didn't think of it this morning, although it was very, very far away. Okay, so that's the plan anyway. We're going to head across in that direction while we do that. Dave is in the Maasai Mar which of course comes with its own challenges that Dave can best. Well, good luck for Tingana and Tingana being the Duke of Juma is always such a big prize and I have always thought seeing Tingana alone is worth seeing maybe two other leopards, you know, just virtually because of his size and above all his huge dewlap. I've seen many leopards in Africa but in Tingana, maybe Jamie might agree with me, or Tristan and Sydney, Tingana has one of the largest dewlops I think we know of, of all the leopards that we see around, uh, you know, Africa. So anyway, talking of lions and not leopards today, on New Year, I'm sure some of you might have uh, watched us here in the Mara Triangle. I was lucky to have seen two leopards, you know, and it isn't, like Juma, you know, getting sightings of leopards 
in the morning it's a bit difficult to see leopards. As much as we got them here, they're all over, they're all over, but you usually say they blend in very well, they hide in some places that you may not be able to see them. But that particular day remains very special to me because one, it was New Year's Day, the first uh, day of 2019, and it was not only one leopard, there were two, and to add cherry on the cake, they were mating. And too many people uh, in, the, in North America, the feedback we got, it was at the stroke of midnight. That was very special. So I have been looking at my clock from the first uh, of January, another 90, 95 days. Hopefully, if that female conceived and you know she stays around, we'll be able to see her cub or her new cubs. I mean, unlike other cats like cheetahs that may move long distances or that do not have uh, territories, leopards and lions, yes, uh, will have territories. Yes, it'll be very good, um, as she says in the final control to have new you know babies that were conceived on the new year that would be very special well today i want to look for one particular pride the pride that i call the sausage tree pride because it's my favorite pride in the mara we got loads of uh lion prides but that particular one is my favorite the area we are going through a little bit further another what uh, five kilometers or so or seven is an area we usually see another pride that is called the Owino. Owino is four girls and one male. And I think originally uh, that pride of Owino used to be the same pride with the sausages. Then they split sometimes in uh, 2016 and they went separate ways. When lions or when prides get very big, they tend to split. Not very far from the camp where we live in, there is another pride there that is called the Ololo Pride and Ololo currently are 16 and I got a feeling that two of the females there have given birth and maybe we have either two more new cubs or four new cubs and that figure might soon rise to 20 well at a given point 20 for the area they live in will be too large and chances are they might also split very good so let's all work very hard let's make sure we get lions this afternoon and i'm sure sydney is doing the same i am working hard now i am somewhere around the buffalo hook dam i'm trying to check if maybe i can find those lions the ones we saw yesterday the mating pairs the two couples were in this area yesterday and since the rain they got disappeared. They haven't been spotted yet since yesterday. So after the rain they went, uh, maybe they went to the Bavalsuk as from here to Bavalsuk is just about five minutes. <laughs> The mating pairs, that is quite a lovely question. Mating pairs on these lions, they can stay together for about seven days and more, less than two weeks. And in that seven consecutive days, they've got to be mating four times approximately an hour. That is quite a responsibility. So that is why sometimes lions on mating, they lose quite a lot of body condition. They become thin, especially if the female went on heat before they eat something then it becomes a challenge because the male doesn't want to go and interact with the other males where the food is so they always isolate each other for mating so they lose body condition and look very much thin <laughs> so but the one Unkuhuma female and the one Avoka were lucky because they have met during the feeding on the buffalo. So they ate and after that they went for mating and it started there. So we are still going to see them for a while because this mating started three days ago. So they still have got, they still have got a long way to go.
So I'm just trying to check some tracks here around the Gwari Pen. This is more or less the same kind of an area we left them yesterday. So far, there are no tracks here at all. So we are going to expect a lot of babies, it means at more or less the same kind of month we might have babies from both females because all these females they have started mating uh, at the same day. So now let's uh, quickly cross over to a man from far, David with the lions. Well, Sydney, keep looking, keep looking because uh, it's by getting some trucks that will lead you to something interesting. Now, there's one major difference between the Mara, Triangle and Juma in terms of vegetation. The Mara is open, it is vast, and you can spot an animal from like what? Sometimes five kilometers, not every animal. I'm not talking of ants or earthworms. I'm talking of big game, for example, elephants, because you do not need to get your falukas to spot some elephants. You just need to open your eyes and open them hard and you end up with some ellies. So that's one of the major differences between where we are and Juma in terms of visibility. Good afternoon, more ladies than gentlemen, I would say, because in alleys or in herds of elephants, ideally you'll see more girls and maybe with their young ones and very few, if any, males, unless, of course, there's a bit of a mating going on. So in a herd like this, I would maybe think all of these are girls and some youngsters, and, of course, the youngsters could be either both boys or girls. There's one massive female there. I'm guessing that one is a female. She is huge by any standard. I mean, look at her. Jenny, could we ever do a bushwalk in the Mara? Yes, it's doable, but I think it has never been tried. And I think the management thinks it's a bit dangerous. But maybe one day they might do it, but we do not do any bushwalks here. And what I think, Jenny, I was just talking a few minutes ago, that there's a huge difference in terms of vegetation or the habitat between where we are and Juma, in the sense that here you see animals from a long, long way. So should you see elephants, I would guess it could be a bit tricky and elephants can easily come and find you, you know, where you are. I'm try just trying to guess. But Jenny, we have not done any bushwalks here, and maybe one day. And when we ask the authorities, they're like, well, they have their own reasons. But it's also possible with proper planning and with the proper training, because guys are trained, and they'll always, just in case, carry a gun for protocol. They know areas to go, how to read the body language of animals, how to look at tracks. So maybe one day, but as it is now, there are no bushwalks that are done in the Mara. Hello there. So you can see the difference in terms of habitat, as I was saying earlier. The openness or the vastness of the Mara. You can see all the way to the horizon. The only visual pollution I got now are these elephants and the trees in the background there. But you can see all the way to the sky. And you're not on a very high elevation. I'm talking about 2,000 meters where I am now, you know, give or take 5,000 feet above sea level. But it all looks plain or flat kind of uh, 180 degrees. Pretty young ones there. Some calves trying to feed on that particular bush. Definitely there's something they are enjoying in that particular thicket. Child of the universe, always got to good to hear your name. Well, there are no, no, uh, no, they're no particular animals, I would say, child of the universe in the Mara that will have a particular season to get babies. For example, elephants, child of the universe, they breed all around the year. Rhinos, the same. Buffaloes, the same. 
Some talking those at the large animals that are think of buffaloes, elephants, and rhinos. They will like be breeding or mating or having their calves child of the universe all around the year. So the only other animals I would think that could have a particular period to have the young ones are the wildebeest, but of course those ones will get the young ones in Serengeti National Park or the Western Ngorongoro Conservation Area in Tanzania. Well, elephants very good entertaining us. We need to move and we also need to take you to South Africa to my friend Tristan. Well, indeed, and so we're not with a cheetah, but there you will see dangling in the boughs of a tree is a carcass. Now, unfortunately, that carcass is not on our side of the road. It's sitting in a inside torchwood at the moment, and we can't go in there, but we think that that carcass might be for Hosanna. We not actually weren't even on our way to him. We're trying to get to Chitwa to try and follow up on a report that uh, Sibui is around, um, and we kind of came across a carcass in the tree, and so apparently the guys say to me who have gone there now that Hosanna might be the one that's there. I'm just trying to see if I can get a view of any leopard actually at the tree itself. But let's see, there's the kind of base of the tree. David, can you see anything? I see a tail. There's a tail there. Yes, there's a head and a tail. So if anybody can ID our leopard from that, then good luck. Hopefully you can and you'll be able to pick up it. I would say Hosanna. It is Hosanna. There we go. <laughs> He's turned his head. So there's Hosanna cat. Hello, boy. There's lots and lots of vultures around. So I wonder if he didn't steal this from something. But there is Hosanna. He's unfortunately deep in Torchwood and there's going to be a lot of cars that want to go there. So we're not going to stay with him too long. But interesting that he is there. That's definitely kind of good news. At least he's got himself a meal. And now we know where he's been hanging out, which is down here on the sort of southwest and um, southeastern boundary and kind of just north of Chitwa Dam is pretty much where we are at the moment. And it explains why he's been absent. But he's definitely got a carcass. It's not a very big carcass. Um, and so... He'll be a happy boy. The problem is, is that there were lots of vultures when we first got here. Now, typically, a uh, carcass in a tree is not something that attracts vultures all that easily. And so I wonder if he maybe didn't get this carcass from somewhere else and he's stolen it. You know, there's been a lot of wild dogs around and those kind of things. Often they'll leave bits of a carcass and that attracts vultures and that's maybe why he's found this carcass. I don't know. But Carol, you say everyone's been very worried about him. Yes, it's never nice when we don't see Osana for a few days. So it's really nice that we saw him at least the albeit very very far away and very brief at least we've managed to kind of get some sort of visual of him and if he goes up into the tree it would actually not be too bad but you can see look at his belly is huge so he's been sitting on food for quite some time he's been eating a lot and i don't know if this carcass is it and he's just kind of been eating this one or may maybe he managed to find diff this carcass today and has been sitting on a different carcass through the course of the last few days so it's interesting either way his tummy is absolutely massive so it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Now, intriguingly enough, Sibui and Cub, like I say, are somewhere in the Mulawanini, which from here to where Hosanna is, is all of about, I would say, maybe 300 meters, 400 meters. And it's going to be intriguing to see if Hosanna actually heads that direction. Um, it's going to be very, very interesting. But he's kind of just lay down um, at the moment. So we're going to carry on. We're going to leave him there. Unfortunately, there's two other cars that are coming this direction. So maybe if a little bit later, if he's up in the tree, we'll come back and kind of spend some time with him. But very cool to see Hosanna. I'm very glad to see him, albeit it's not very nice visual. So naughty Hosanna, you need to come back this way and then maybe we'll get lucky. In the meantime, though, let's send you back across to Sydney, who I'm sure will be happy to hear that things are starting to change and maybe our luck will change in his luck will change too. Congratulations to uh, Tristan for finding your host. I haven't seen him for quite a long time now. I am still around here by the Bavers Hook area checking around this dam. I am now checking the northern part of the dam to see if maybe we can find these lions and I am sometimes even stopping and killing the engine so that I can hear if there is any of the mating rituals taking place. very much quiet at the moment yeah but the lions when they're mating they take a little bit of nap wake up and carry on so 
maybe they are somewhere here just having a nap. I, I didn't get your question. If you can repeat that, that. Sai, uh, that is quite a very, very important question and it's one of the interesting questions. So let me explain this uh, in full. The ostrich cycle of the female has got nothing to do with the presence of a male. Uh, this is how it works. The female, when her condition is right due to some of the ostrogen hormones, she goes on ostrich and she can be on ostrich when the male is not there. If he is around, then he's lucky to detect ostras at early stage. As these lions, females are walking around, is when they will meet these males, and then mostly the females, when they're excited, they approach the males, and the males will come and confirm by sniffing the genitals of the females and detect if she is ready for mating. Sometimes the males themselves can also drive a female to go on ostras under the following condition. When the female has got the cups, after a fight with a new male, uh, the dominant male when fighting an intruder, if the intruder wins the fight, we have seen a lot doing what is called to infanticide, killing the baby of the previous male. When the female sees the baby's dead, that gives the female a lot of stress. Female lions under stress, the oestrogen hormone uh, gives a lot of uh, hormone in order to drive the female back into ostra so that the male can start their own generation. So sometimes males can drive the female to go on ostras. So, but the, the, the mating pairs we saw, there's ostras, they all took place under a normal condition. So now, while I am still searching for the lions, let's quickly go back to the fully bellied Hosan. Well, it's not Hosanna, Sydney. We've driven a few hundred meters, and there you can see there's another little spotty cat sitting under the tree. So this is not Sabui and Cub either, who are also, again, not even a hundred meters from where we are. So there's four leopards seemingly in a row here. Now, it looks like Clalumba to me. I haven't really got a good look yet, and I haven't been able to look with my binoculars um, properly. And so you guys would have got a good shot there with the camera. Um, and so I would have kind of, I wasn't 100% sure when we first got here and then I bumped into somebody that I haven't seen in many, many, many years that was actually at Singita when I was training there. So I had a quick chat to him as we bumped into this leopard and then, so I haven't actually had a chance to even ID who it is, but I think Lalamba is who it looks like, which makes me wonder if maybe that kill in the tree was not Tundi's and Clalumba's and maybe Hosanna has come in and found it due to the vultures being around but you can see there she's sitting oh, she's got her head kind of side on I can use my binos to have a little look at that spot pattern is it you girl because you've gotten quite big if it is you it looks like you so it's crazy there's just cats everywhere at this stage of the afternoon lots and lots of spotty bums but all in the wrong places so this is in like, once again inside torchwood which is not really ideal i don't see any sign of tandy at the moment you can see there's a few vultures there so i wonder if maybe there's more of a kill somewhere in this side and maybe that's kind of what's going on but interesting to see Michelle, yes, very possible. I mean, you must understand if Tandy killed um, the day before and then she kind of finished that up and came down here and killed again. Um, if Clalamba ate a little bit, she ate a bit, and then Hosanna rocked up and ate as much as he looks like he's eaten, then it's very possible that that could have been, you know, it could have been, what's that now, 24 hours, 36 hours? Um, so it's a lot of food, but that has been eaten, but, uh, you know, these cats can put away quite a bit. So it's interesting to kind of 
figure out exactly what happened, but the way that Columbus sitting as close as she is to where Hosanna was makes me think that potentially Tandi had the kill. Or she's also been attracted to the vultures, much like, you know, predators are. They often do come and kind of get curious with vultures and they'll come and try and investigate what's going on and what's happening um, and try and kind of see how everything's going. But it amazes me that we've got, like I say, Sabui and Cub, Klalamba and Hosanna within a very small sh sort of space. Now, Sabui and Cub is going to be an interesting one because they're not going to be very happy about seeing Klalamba. She's going to have to be very careful with Sabui being around. She would not want to tangle with her. Hosanna's not a problem because he's bulky enough to take care of himself, even with the likes of Sabui. Um, and so it's going to be an interesting kind of evening that's going to play out. Hopefully, you know, little Klalamba actually heads north. It's not good for us in, uh, if she moves northwards, but um, in terms of um, the kind of way things go, um, it would be better in the long run if she went away from where Sabui is. So it's going to be an interesting afternoon, that's for sure. I wonder if Hosanna will be kind of brave enough to leave his kill and wander down towards the Muluwanini to come and investigate what's going on down here and bump into all of these leopards on this side. But from no leopards to lots. Krita and Monique, you say, did I cover myself in catnip once again? So, no, I didn't. I was actually, to be honest with you, I was quite worried about this afternoon because we obviously have our TV show and we had nothing this morning. And we're a bit kind of concerned as to where everybody is. But it seems as though everyone decided to have a party on the main road close to Chitwa. And so it was a worthwhile kind of just coming down and seeing what's going on this side. The, the thing is, is that, you know, there's obviously been kind of some interaction between these leopards I, I don't think that they can all be in the same place at once with this many vultures without anybody kind of realizing that there's a leopard here so I think they've all kind of come in for the same reason and, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if Hosanna oh, there's another leopard behind us hello Tundi so there's Tundi behind us I think it's Tundi behind us yes there comes Klalamba that's very very cool <laughs> so there's actually five leopards in the space <laughs> of I don't even it's not even 500 meters that there's five cats and you can see their tummies are full so I think they were on that kill as well but how awesome is this to have Tandi and Tlalamba and hopefully they're going to move into Chitwa because that will allow us to be able to follow them so we're just going to turn around so we can actually see them hello Tandi it's exciting those are cool have they got another kill they looks like it they do so they've got another kill here. So there's actually three kills in the space of 500 meters by the looks of things. So you can see there is another kill right there. David, can you got a good line of shot there? It's a bit tricky with her face. But there we go. There's another carcass right over there, which is absolutely crazy. So we've got Hosanna on a kill, these two on a kill, and Sabui and Cub on a kill down in the Mulawanini. So three different leopard kills in 500 meters which is pretty insane any way that you look at it but good for us um it's it's good news it means that you know we've got a lot at least lots going on in the course of this evening but what it also means is that maybe sydney wants to come and head down towards chitwa i'm not sure if it's possible if tech wise I forget these things these days but if he wants to maybe head down towards chitwa and he can kind of come and maybe go to one of the other leopards. I think that would be a, probably a good idea, given that we're not going to be able to cover all of these um, by ourselves. And I'm sure you guys want to see Sabui and Cub too. I don't think the Cub's ever been seen on any of our live drives, so I think it would be nice if she was also kind of put on camera at some point. But either way, very, very cool kind of afternoon that's developed out of absolutely nowhere and it's blustery kind of conditions and I thought we were going to have a really kind of tough afternoon to be able to see you know Tani and Tlalamba and Hosanna and have all of these cats come out has is, is been pretty insane so I'm very very lucky at this stage The only problem with a sighting like this in this particular area is that it's going to be a complete bun fight because there's going to be cars going up and down and being on the main road, it's obviously going to be a bit tricky. Um, there's going to be a lot of people kind of moving around. And so what I hope that's going to happen is Tandi is actually going to move this deeper into Chitwa or, and that will just kind of make everything a little bit more sort of settled as we won't have as many cars. But how cool is this? <laughs> I'm so happy right now that we managed to find these two. I 
kind of driving along going down towards where we thought Sabui was and kind of there was a little Clalumba just sitting on the side of the road and I actually didn't even look to my right because I spotted her first and I must have just driven straight past um, Tandi which she probably did not enjoy at all. Um, very cool though but we might just reposition ourselves and just get into a better spot while we do that though let's send you back up to the Masai Mara and David who I think is on the search for his sausages and hopefully with some luck he'll manage to find them by the end of the evening well we left the elephant kept moving on heading towards the area I'm hoping to get some lions today but of course as usual along the way you meet a lot of traffic and you have found this traffic of elands, the largest antelopes that we got in Africa, huge, and my guess is they're males. They seem like to be four boys, massive in size. Always slightly bit bigger than the females in terms of horns and body morphology and everything else. Now, when we talk of migration, we'll always talk of wildebeest zebras, but also we got, or we usually have a small percentage of the migration that consists of these antelopes here that are called elands and one of it or the one you see on the back there's a bird that is trying either to get some ticks or mites two birds actually from its body you'll get most of these herbivores being you know inhabited by ticks or mites and these birds that we call ox because will always help them or remove them in a kind of relationship that we call symbiosis or a symbiotic relationship and we've got two types of ox speakers either red build or the yellow build ox speakers now my guess is these are four boys here there isn't a single girl males in general being big in size as a little grayish in color it's a massive dual up they'll have was the one in the front a young male yeah could be a little, a little younger than the other four well, we may just have to move on a little bit so that we make it to our destination where I'm hoping to go and get the lions. All right, wonderful light at the moment. Just looking nice, feels very, very good. And in the kind of grass we have now, I will not be surprised to spot something from a distance and comfortably I'll be able to pick whatever I see. Excellent, just friends of ours who are just moving. Hello there. Very good. We'll talk to you. Very good. Very good. Let's go back to Tristan and see how it looks like. Yes, we're still sitting with these two. Now, while we've been kind of off air, I've been trying to chat to everybody, and there was obviously mass confusion because everyone thought this was Sabui and Cub, and obviously, quite clearly, it's quite clearly it's not. It's Tandi and Klalamba, and so everyone was a little bit... I thought it would be odd for those two to be this close to these two um, and not be any sort of altercation what was going on. Like, 100 meters between those two cats, given that we know Tandi and Sabui have already fought before, would be very odd, and, and this position for Sabui would be strange she's never come up this far and to drag a cub this way would have been quite interesting so it's a little bit of a mystery solved it's Tandi and Klalamba and not Sabui that are kind of in this area but it's really good news for us because you know you can see she's got a substantial meal it's going to probably keep her here for most of the afternoon the problem is the hyenas will eventually come and they will you know basically if she doesn't get it up into a tree it's going to be a bit of a problem the other thing is is that she hasn't chosen anywhere near a nice tree if she goes up the tree that she's in i don't think we'll even see her there's so much kind of vegetation around it and it's a pity because there's so many nice marulas just to the back from where she is and would have been so nice to kind of see monique not as far as we know um so these cubs theoretically um, should have been fathered potentially by um, this this unknown male that's kind of been hanging around little gari vessels um, the one that has been uh, who saw it i think it was taylor was it or somebody got the, a visual of him um one day and so he's around and and we think it's him um or potentially maybe a male from Malamala, Mala, but um, quarantine could be an outsider. But I don't think Tingana. There was no ever. There was never a sign of him mating with her, and he didn't really go down much at all. But now you can see little Clalumba. She's trying to kind of 
be submissive and playful and she's trying to almost show off to Tandy to try and kind of let her feed on this impala but Tandy's having nothing she's eating as much as she can and is really kind of going to town what I wonder is maybe if this particular impala maybe didn't get killed and had a little baby inside and maybe Hosanna has gotten the baby and, and Tandy and Tlalamba have gotten this part of it it's interesting because they're just too close for them not to have known about each other leopards are very very perceptive they'll watch birds of prey they'll smell things and the way the wind is blowing this wind is pushing straight to where Tandi and Tlalamba um, or I mean where Hosanna has been so they should know about each other now you can hear she's getting upset Tandi she's hissing and growling while trying to eat at the same time. It can't be easy to have a hooligan child like Clalamba. She's got to work cut out. We know over the past year and a bit, it's taken a lot of effort to sort out um, Tandi, or Tlalamba and kind of keep her safe. Hello girl. So nice to see. Right, now our day has infinitely gotten better with a lot of spots, but there's also some tawny cats that have peered and creeped out of the woodwork and Jamie's managed to find them. Listen. How cool is this? Right next to the car. There's a very good chance he's going to growl at us. Don't even think about it, my boy. Move very slowly. Ah uh ah. -uh. No. No. I'm going to sit very still. I will move back from him when I can. Okay, my boy. Okay. I'll explain everything in a second. Okay. All right, I'm going to move back from you in a sec. If uh, Slowly. That's it, lie down. There we go. Okay. 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 All right. I'm going to move very, very slowly. Ah, uh ah. -uh. Very slow backwards. This is the skittish evoker male, presumably. Sorry, I couldn't take my eyes off him for a second there. Because there was a very good chance that he was going to come at the car. Cool. Just to clarify, I didn't park on top of them. Already when we drove in he was a bit unhappy but when then obviously when the female walked towards us there was nothing I could do I couldn't move then because that aggression while he was about to mate with her would have provoked him so all we're doing is we get a space he's here I hope did you get that shot of him hissing at us awesome I wish I'd had my camera
very cool. Very, very cool. Okay, cool. So we've settled down a nice comfortable distance. The female's going to keep doing that to us, which is, well, I mean, we've got cats coming out of our ears now. I mean, I know these were the lions that Sydney was looking for. We were looking for Tingana, but we've stumbled upon them instead. <sighs> if anybody says to you that the feeling of a lion's growl doesn't travel through their chest, then they're lying to you. It does, and it has a kickstart straight to your adrenal gland, whether or not you want to admit it. Lots of people have been in the bush for many years and will refuse to concede that, but they're wrong. It does. Right, I apologize for the breakup. Apparently every time we move our vehicle, it causes a few issues, which of course is par for the course. That's okay. We'll probably... The correct decision here is for me to go home and for Sydney to make his way in. Because if they move further into this drainage or if they move around like that, then we will have to move with them. So if we're having a problem while we're moving, I think M's. Yeah. Ah, okay. All right. Well, we'll, we'll figure this all out as we go along. <laughs> Sydney is apparently with Tundi now. We're playing, we're playing swap the lions round or cats round. Yes, no, it's not Sydney, um, Jamie, it is with me. But anyway, what you don't often see is that, is what I was about to say, is two leopards feeding on a carcass at once. And you can see why they don't like it when, it's not like lions, where lions will often feed on the carcass at the same time. Leopards are not like that. They generally get a little bit upset if somebody else is feeding on the exact same carcass as what they are. And so Lalumba is kind of pushing her luck a little bit. She's managed to find herself a little snack there that she's going to kind of feed off and try and get. But these two cats are absolutely full, full, full. And after making a kill two days ago, we were talking about it just now, would they be able to make another kill? Well, most definitely. And as you can see there, it's a rather large kill too. Now, what is Tundi doing? She's almost dragging it along and is going to feed off it. This side, uh, maybe she's just prepping just so that it's close enough to a tree that if she needs to get it up, she can. I mean, that's gonna be a heavy carcass for her. I, the chances of her keeping this during the course of the night is going to be quite tricky and yes, I mean a lot of aggression today. Everybody's getting a little bit grumpy with one another. Hello little Flanumba. What are you doing? She's such a funny cat this as well. How cool is this though? Absolutely awesome to have these two cats here together. I'm so glad that they are around. It's lovely to kind of be able to find them and spend time with them. The problem is, is that we're not gonna be able to spend much time with them here unfortunately now there's many 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 cars that want to come through the sighting and so given that we would like to have them a little bit later we're probably going to make some space just now and allow everybody else to rotate through and then we can come back a little bit more in the evening so Jenny, wild dogs are most definitely a threat to leopards. Um, that's very cool to see two leopards feeding off a carcass. It's not very often that you'll get that at the same time. Like I say, they very seldom will tolerate one another feeding. It's just lucky that this carcass is so stretched that they're actually doing it. But back to the question, so wild dogs can be dangerous to leopards for sure. Both can be dangerous to one another. It depends obviously on the circumstance and numbers. Um, so if uh, you know an adult male leopard comes across a puppy or something like that, it's going to be able to hurt, kill it. But like those 18 dogs we saw the other day would be a major threat to leopards and you'll find leopards will try and get up into a tree as quick as possible in order to try and get away and to try and kind of move off and try and sort of establish themselves as a, you know, get away from that kind of area um, and, and up into a tree and stay as safe as possible. So, you know, it's it's one of those kind of things and the way it kind of works is, is that they'll often try and... Um, well, now we've got a tug of war between mom and daughter, look. <laughs> <laughs> you silly cats. <laughs> well, you can see Tandy's much stronger than Clalumba still. <laughs> I don't know what the, what she was thinking that little Clalumba thought she might be able to pull mom back, but she certainly tried for a little bit, didn't she? You were like your cousin or your brother, should I say, Hosanna, half brother. Absolute clown, this cat, but she's so much fun to watch. 
I believe a lot of you enjoyed that thoroughly. I did there as well. Right, now, like I said, unfortunately, we are going to have to make space. Uh, there's a lineup that is longer than the number of fingers on my digit on my hands, and so I'm going to have to kind of give up a spot and just let other people come through. Like I said, we'll come back later. We won't, we won't sort of leave it until too late. We'll come back before the end of drive. But while we do that, let's send you back across to David in the Masai Mara, see if he's had any luck on his side. Hopefully he does because it seems as though the tables are turning and slowly but surely, luck is starting to come our way. How exciting to see Leopards, you know, and uh especially to see such a youngster like Salamba playing. Now, I remember a few days ago we were having a little poll on uh, cubs of all sorts of cats we think of, cheetahs, leopards and lions, and we were asking the viewers which one they think is most entertaining in play. And I think majority of the people agreed that leopard cubs are the sweetest, and I think that is true. And initially we started the poll among us ourselves. I think it was between myself and Tristan and Tr Sydney. And we started with lions and leopard cubs. And the three of us uh, in unison agreed leopard cubs are more fun, which I think should be the case. Well, as I was saying earlier, we, we saw two leopards mating here at the beginning of the year. And hopefully, if we're gonna have our own cubs in the Mara, we shall see a new or Kenyan Tralamba playing maybe by the end of March or early April, who knows. I'm almost getting to the area I call the Sausage Republic and I have given it that particular name because the pride of lions around here defend this territory with their teeth, you know, with their claws, with their might and they do not allow any other lions or lionesses around here. Not only do they fight other lionesses or, you know, they also fight other predators like hyenas. So should a, a hyena come here just by mistake and try to crisscross this area, the sausages will always do a very quick piece of work to get them out of this area. Well, I think Jamie got more interesting uh, predators than myself. We'll go back to her. And of course, they chose to mate right behind the car once again. It's quite an enthusiastic mating, this. And by that, I don't mean, you know, the, the 30 seconds or so that the actual act ta takes. I just mean that the frequency with which they're mating is quite impressive. So we know that it's early days because apparently they were on a buffalo kill two days ago. And it was only yesterday that they started mating. And they're obviously really going into the full sort of cycle of her estrus now. So he's very, very possessive of her, which is partly why the combination of the fact that he's not entirely relaxed with vehicles and the fact that, um, well, he's mating, combined to make a slightly more aggressive lion. Aggressive is the wrong word. Really, that implies some sort of fault. Oh, Sydney's coming. Sydney's arriving at the speed of light, everyone. I could hear him. Oh, I can hear him coming from. My goodness. Here he comes. <laughs> High speed Sydney. Speedy Sydney. He needs a name. <laughs> awesome. Here he comes. Cool. Alrighty, we're going to guide Sydney in. He is enthusiastically making his way towards us. Let us send you across to David while we do that to see what he has to say. Yes, and I was saying, you know, the sausages also do not only fight other, you know, lions that would come to this area, and especially females, but they also fight other predators like hyenas. So this is the reason, or that's the reason, why I call this area. They control it and there's no any other lions we have seen come here. The only thing or the only uh, power they don't have is to control the coalition of males. Ideally, I'm sure you know in the lion's kingdom, the males will always decide 
who will be mating with who or who will be where. But ideally, the females make sure no other females come around. Well, we have heard before the current two males that have been mating the sausages that are called the Ondonio Pike, two young stars, I'd call them, or two males. Before them, there was another coalition of males and there was one dominant male that was called Kipuli, who joined most likely uh, two youngsters from uh, this particular pride and they formed a coalition. Now, it has been some time. We haven't seen them. We do not know where they are. And I think the two boys now of the old Donya Pike are the reigning champions of this particular territory. Yesterday, we saw the sausages had brought down a buffalo and a male buffalo, which was very good of them. And it's my favorite pride of the pride that they are capable of doing as females to bring the of a male, I think to me is a very well done. But of course, there are two we we love following, and one of them is called Kingtail. Kingtail usually has bent on her tail, but as they try to find out where they could be today, we'll take you back to Sydney in South Africa. So you can see the pause that we are right now with the mating pair. Just taking it over me at the moment. All the credits for this afternoon with these lions goes to Jamie. Is the one who found them and congratulations to her. So you can see that the mating continues as we left them yesterday. So they, they are going to have a very busy week. <laughs> So now you can see that the male is right there. He doesn't want to hear anything. He doesn't want to move away from this female. And this is uh, normally, this is normal. Uh, every time the male has got a female, they become so very much protective. And sometimes they are even active, uh, um, they are even much more aggressive against also the vehicles coming to have a sighting. Oh, this is the same one we were with yesterday. You can see the smiley. I saw that. So when the female is starting to wave, wave the tails a lot, it's when she's going to wake up and ask him to come and carry on with his responsibility. You can see this male looks very beautiful. But look at all those scratch marks. You can see that uh, he has been fighting a lot. They are focus. They are not that very much old. They are just now uh, close to four years or above four years. But if you look at these scratch marks, you can see that he has been really fighting for a dominance most of the time. So it's good that uh, the other brother who is together with him is also having a companion. Oh, you can see now, oh, you can see uh, these lions are just uh, very, very much relaxed as I have indicated. You see the, the female is starting to wave the tail there. You can see the tussle of the tail. Magic dragon wizard, this is asleep indeed. You can see that these lions, they look very tired. But at least we know the reason why they are so very much tired. But apart from this kind of responsibility, it's normal. These kind of big cats, uh, during the day, they prefer to sleep. But now, the weather is changing. I can see that it's becoming overcast. And when it's overcast, the temperature, when it's, it's slow, 
the lions they do uh, start walking around but at the moment there's no need for these two to walk around because they are mating but those who are not part of any mating activities is the ones who are now encouraged by this kind of weather for them to go out and do some hunting. Kathy um, is very much young to have this kind of scars. Why am I saying this? Because if these kind of lions are just now about, are focused just now above uh, four years old, when these kind of animals reach four years, it's when they are reaching the, the right level of maturity. Some of them, they start to mate when they are four, some even more than five that is determined by the strength and competition in the area so these kind of scars uh, on this kind of uh, aged animal i think is too much at this stage so this is what we expect when he's much older than this You can see that the main day is bald a little bit. <laughs> so it's moving uh, the ears all the time. So now let's quickly uh, cross over to David by the Masai Mara, who's got something very interesting. Feather friend is one of the most unique birds you'll see in Africa because actually this bird here it is an eagle and we call her the secretary bird because she will always spend most of her time on the ground that's why I'm saying she is unique and I'm sure we all know eagles will be up in the air patched up on trees and I would say not exactly an eagle but she's very closely related two egos and this is the secretary bird and secretary bird uh, translates into a hunter's bird that's why they call it secretary bird which is a, a French corruption of Arabic secretia and you always get them on the ground while they'll be looking for prey of all sorts you might think of and they do a lot of carnivores I'm talking of them getting grasshoppers, getting locusts, getting small mammals, rodents, mice, and once in a while you'll also get them catching snakes. And they use the very strong feet to, you know, kill the snakes, they stamp on them, as you see them, they're walking very strong feet and talons they got. And in general they go in twos, a male and a female, not sure where the other one could be. They're very monogamous but and they'll always tend to uh, have their nests on top of tall trees. Becky, you see they're quite funny looking and especially when they walk, you know, they're nothing, anything similar to like the vultures you see there up on that thorn tree there. And I think the secretary bird was more appealing or more beautiful than the vultures you see on this thorn tree. They look like flowers. What do you think? They look like flowers on this tree here and a few <coughs> different types of vultures here. African have white backed vultures, I guess, and we also got the hooded vultures. And naturally, we'll always think, we'll always associate vultures with kills. And as I was saying, Earlier, when I was around this place yesterday, the sausages had brought themselves down. They had brought themselves some dinner for the new, for the new year, and they had a huge buffalo that they had preyed on. I think the night before last, and when I left, they had eaten like almost half of it. And I guess chances are they still have most of it left, or if finished, they do not have moved very far from that particular area. And seeing these vultures here is a clear indication that the sausages are still there very good so i leave these vultures and try to go to the same place i saw the sausages yesterday and even blackie will be able to see them let's first go back to sydney
So these vultures will always indicate that there's something dead somewhere. And we have always said if there's something dead somewhere, then the owners of that prey or that kill could be there. And chances are there will be some sort of predators. Now, vultures to me are always associated with big predators like lions. And I'm talking of the sausages. For those of you who are joining us now, when I talk of the sausages, it's a particular pride of lions that lives in this particular area. And we call it the sausage tree pride because they've been found to climb particular trees here in Kenya or in the Mara Triangle that are called sausage trees. And they love climbing them to get away from the flies if there's so many flies in the grass on the ground here. Or if it's too hot and they want some shaded area, they tend to climb those particular trees. If you're lucky today and you see those trees, we'll tell you why we also call them the sausage trees. Because when they bear fruit, the fruit takes the shape of a sausage, just the normal sausage that we eat at home. Now, earlier we had a secretary bird, and I'm sure all oh, something different there. We got different antelopes, and we got what we will call a hartebeest. Very good job, Bungay. On the horizon there, we got hartebeest, and hartebeest are some antelopes that are similar to other antelopes that we call toppies. Very particular, this hartebeest. Definitely the herbivores and feeding at that very top area of the horizon. Well, we're going to be moving because I need to get the sausages before it gets dark. And as I do that, we'll take you back to Tristan. Well, you are back with me and we are slowly bumbling down to Chitwa Dam to go and see what's happening at the dam. We're going to go and see if there's any sign of any of the Pratton Coles that often hang around here and just kind of generally just take it easy for a while until the sort of madness settles up there and then we can go back again. There's too many cars, it's crazy up there. So, you know how I have a phobia for cars, so I'll try and avoid there as much as I can when it comes to sort of that area and so I'd rather come and have a little look at Chitwa Dam and see what's happening on this side of the world. It's always a good side to come as I haven't been here in so long I don't even know what it looks like really anymore. So I can't actually remember the last time I was sort of live from Chitwa Dam and did any sort of segments of any sort of description actually it's been a long time. Anyway, it's exactly, you know, it's still a big puddle of water. In fact, it's actually not as big as it should be. It's still quite low, actually. You can see the island hasn't taken place. Sorry, excuse me. I got the hiccups a little bit there. Um, so the lions have, I mean, the the island hasn't taken place. I don't know why I'm saying lions. Maybe it's because I heard lions just now. I'm having an absolute nightmare to talk this afternoon. I don't know what's going on. I've been struggling to speak to anyone, really. So it's been a bit tricky. I, Yes, the words, get them out. I need to do the word exercises when I, during the break before we start our TV shows. Obviously. But anyway, hippos are everywhere. No sign of any of the Pratt and Coles that are here. So I don't know if they've arrived or maybe they're not going to come this year, which would be quite sad. It's one of the few places in the, in fact, it's the only place in the Sabi Sands that I know of that you can get a, a regular sighting of them or used to be able to get a regular sighting of them. So it'll be a bit sad if they don't come to this area but nice to have the hippos they're busy bobbing about as they do they like to kind of bob in the water and take it very easy and especially on a day like today i suppose it's not exactly bad weather the water will probably be very pleasant to be in it's been fairly warm during the middle part of the day and it's now just slowly starting to kind of cool down a bit and there's a bit of a breeze and clouds that are blowing in but i suppose being a hippo water in the summer months is your best friend but the Chitra Dam de definitely has a lot of water to still kind of gain and fill it up. Um, the fact that there's islands are no longer islands, um, bar the really big one on the right, means that it's still very, very low and it, it needs a lot more water until it's back to its normal sort of state. Um, and that's obviously going to take 
a bit of time but at least this process has started it must have been very low before the kind of rains arrived recently and when you put an expanse of water like this the problem with it is that it is a lot of evaporation you get a huge amount of wind that blows as well as sun and that causes this to kind of um, dry out quite quickly so especially when it's very hot temperatures now there's my favorite little birds that we see at Chidwell are around though there's the little um, three banded plovers and remember last was last year or the year before actually I can't even remember now um, where we had the little tiny baby chicks and the eggs that we found and so these little three banded plovers are very cool little birds I always love watching them kind of move around and peck around for insects no sign of any little ones with them today but maybe their chicks are somewhere here and we'll be able to find them at some point Cenac no no fish eagles that I can see I was scouting about but I don't see any fish eagles at all what I can see is a spoonbill that is sitting it looks like a spoonbill it has a spoonbill face that's sitting on the top of that tree so it looks like to be a spoonbill that's sitting there but no fish eagles that I can spot at this stage I'm looking in the jackalberry that's off to the dam side looking in the dead trees but no sign of where he likes to, or where they like to normally sit they might be on the other side of the dam somewhere they often do sit there's a tree that's kind of in front of the last rooms that they sometimes sit at right well we're going to mill about on Chitwa we'll amble and see what we can find in the meantime though back up to David who has been successful and has found exactly what he was looking for Very good, Tristan. Chitwa area is always a wonderful and very productive area. And I got a very hungry uh, gentleman here who, at a quick look on one of his left eyes, I thought he got an injured left eye. But that is not stopping him from devouring this uh, male buffalo that I was talking about. I was here yesterday. I'm saying I did not have to work very hard to come and trace this wonderful sighting. And for those of you who could be a little dis be disturbed or a little skirmish by watching something like this, uh, you may choose not to watch and maybe do something different or switch on to another channel or switch off and maybe come back later. But again, this is how things go here. This is the chain. And this is the food chain here in Africa wilderness. Now, this male belongs to the Oldonio Pike males. It's the coalition of males I was talking about. There are always two. I do not know where the other one is. I just found this one feeding on this particular uh, buffalo male that was, I think, killed the night before last. I do not know where the girls are, but definitely I'm sure they're not very far. Now, look on his left eye, and I think he he is injured, if I'm not wrong. And he got a scar there, and it looks a little bit blood, bloody. And you can see he isn't opening it properly. And I think, yeah, it must have either he was an inf he, he got an infection or he was involved in a fight because it looks a little infected, it looks a little bloody, it looks like it got a scar. So it could be both. It's either an infection or it's the infection would have come from a scar. Because if you look at the very, on the eyelids there, exactly, thank you, Bungay, it's bloody. So maybe it got a claw mark there or it got a teeth mark there. And of course, in the process, if it's a wound, and then because of the flies and all that, it will definitely get an infection. And I would guess if it's a proper infection, then both eyes would be affected. But we're going to be investigating and find out what, you know, could be happening. And the good news is this cuts are very resilient, and they very quickly recover from such infections. If it's an infection, of course, if it's a wound, definitely it will come out of it. There's a particular coalition of males in the Mara Triangle that we call the Scarfis, and that's the main male lion in that particular coalition. And he got such a huge scar on the eye, and that's how he was named the Scarfis. And of course, males every other few months will definitely go for each other for takeovers of prides. And when that happens, it's always sometimes life and death. It's not. It's never a walkover. So there's a lot of clawing. There's a lot of teething. Sometimes they lose the eyes. 
giraffe, rib, yum, yes. I mean, personally, I'm thinking, well, this could make some very nice ribs if we could do some roasting, you know? It could be very nice uh, rib eye if someone could roast it for us. Yuri, you're saying this is the lion, yes, and this is a male, and it belongs to a coalition of uh, two males that we call the Oldonio Pike. It belongs to a coalition of two males that we call the Oldonio Pike, and definitely you can tell. If you see the other one, the male, the, the male is much darker and much longer than this one here. So this one, sometimes we call him Blondie, and when you compare the characters of the other two, this one here is always a little bit moody, a little bit n n n between moody and grumpy there and the other one is always very cooperative the times when you look at him he is like what are you where are you looking at me you know and i'm guessing chances are he might have found the girls eating and he pushed them out with the carrots and until he eats enough and some of the lions have been known to eat up like to 20 percent of their body weight you would imagine if this guy could be anything 250 kilos or 500 pounds or so, he could be eating almost 50 kilos, almost going to 100 pounds of meat in, you know, one sitting. I mean, they eat a lot, lions, and that's why they end up going flat to be able to digest what they have eaten slowly and surely, also conserving their energy. Remember, should you have any questions or any comments? You may send them using hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. We get lots of joy to hear from you. Why did you rise? Do you want to have a change? You've got a scratch there. Either way, he is very handsome. I mean, comparing to the other one that I think is much handsome than the other one. Well, I'm going to be waiting. Hopefully, the brother or the other pride male will be coming around. Let's first go back to Sydney. So you can see that uh, the Uma Pride as well as one representative of the Avokas are now resting. But the Avoka is very much wary. I can see that he is trying to judge something around here. So they have just been mating on the past 5-10 minutes uh, while you are away. We have just missed that action due to some technical uh, poor signal difficulties. So here I can see they are tired at the moment and they are just lying down. Look at how beautiful that mane is. That is so charming. I'm not surprised why this female uh, is staying together with this beautiful uh, smiley maned male. Look at that. Uh, this is so amazing. This is a gorgeous male you can see that. So the lions they've got to mate mostly uh, every 15 minutes and they are going to do this for about five to six sometimes seven days or more and if you can check if they do five to six days in full after every 15 minutes it means they can mate up to 250 times a day so now let's quickly cross over to Tristan with a bird not just with a bird Sydney it's a bird that is as beautiful as your male lion and could rival it for good looks and especially when it's set amongst the greenery of that weeping wattle to have that bright kind of iridescent blue wing and that red beak and white chest makes that woodland kingfisher look as glorious as you could ever imagine you see it's got a little pond there where it's had a bit of a dip in order to just clean itself up and make sure that its feathers are all nice and clean and looked after they often do this and then people will think that they're actually fishing and they're not they basically are going there to essentially clean their feathers out and so they'll just drop into water soak themselves a little bit and they have a little bit of a bath and then they groom themselves out and make sure that they are really well looked after now these guys are, are seriously beautiful but when I was sitting here looking at them just now I was thinking about um, a kingfisher that I saw in the Congo um, while we were there and, and it's got to be one that's really kind of I suppose rivals for me rivals these woodlands in terms of just striking and the reason why is is I'll show you now um, I've just got to try and find a picture of it um, if I can hopefully I will be able to um, 
but they they really have this seriously kind of blue appearance to them they are incredibly pretty birds um vibrant 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 blue right now i found the picture but apparently sydney is still with the mating pair i wonder if they may be going to mate so we'll quickly send them off to you and then i'll show you the kingfisher when you come back so you can see that we just caught them by the right time now but listen to the rituals listen That was amazing. You can see that the female is losing all the energy. She can't even fight him back now like the beginning a few days ago, whereby after the withdrawal of the male or during the withdrawal, she was turning and scratched his head and tried to fight back and he was also retaliating back. So you can see these two, they are not gonna go far as they are just mating after every 15 minutes and more. So they will be around you. Look at her turning now, trying to fix her copulatory genital passage. As the male, it is equipped, the male's copulatory organ is equipped with quite a lot of spikes, which helps in order to scratch the internal part of the female. And this was so lovely. So you saw the male, he was trying to grab the female from the back. That is normal. These kind of animals, when they're still very young, moved from one place to another, from one den to the other by the females. Uh, when the female grabs by the back, you will see they become lamb and he can be able, she can be able to move them. So what the male is doing the same thing, is trying to stabilize the female from grabbing her at the back. Now he's... Tam, indeed, she must be exhausted. Imagine this is happening after every 15 minutes. As I indicated earlier, 250 times if this is happening uh, in full consecutive five days. That is quite a huge responsibility on both male and females. You can see that he's trying to pick up some of this information from the air particles, but he's also going to lie down. He's not going to stand there much longer. Look at the body now. You can see the stomach is getting empty again. He was so full. They just fed on a buffalo three days ago, but all the energy they are now used in order for them uh, to mate. Look at that. She wants to rest nicely, I'm sure, the female. You can see she's just reallocating. Apologies for the pole. I'm just going to try and move a little bit, but let me wait until they're settled. You can see that she's even now moving away. She doesn't want to see him after she, she has been uh, scratched by this male during the withdrawal. But she will come back again and she will be the one to approach him again and ask him again for another action. So now let's uh, close back to Tristan and see how he's doing. It will happen again, Sydney. As when they get into it, they certainly don't hold back, do lions and, and cats when they are mating. And so hopefully they will mate once again for you guys. But I was talking about our kingfisher. So this is the kingfisher that I was talking about. So it's called a shining blue kingfisher. And you can see why it's called a shining blue kingfisher. So it's got this iridescent dark blue on the sort of back edge. And then this light colored blue that runs through the middle section with an orange belly. And it really is striking. Now it doesn't look that great in this picture. as unfortunately the best picture I could find because the light there is quite dull. But when we saw them in the Congo, we were going along one of these little tributaries that goes out of the by and into the main river the Lakoli river and we're kind of going along and then they flushed out and they went and sat on this branch and as they kind of went out the sun came out and that color just went electric electric blue it was incredible how beautiful they were they're really really pretty birds and we had looked for them for days and days and days and so i was super happy that we managed to find them the other bird that actually occurs up there funny enough that i forgot completely about is another kingfisher that looks 
almost like our woodlands. It's called a blue-breasted kingfisher, um, which and its call is actually quite s similar too, which is quite interesting. They a very kind of funny looking bird I suppose actually closer towards a mangrove kingfisher than a than a woodlands but they are basically there we go hold on I found a picture David give me two seconds I'm going to show you so they they have a similar look to the mangroves uh, kingfisher that we see here they've got that sort of black eye stripe it's a little bit similar I suppose to the the um, woodlands but you see the kind of blue breast band that gives you that name a blue breasted kingfisher very very pretty bird as well and they fly around and they make this call very similar to the woodland kingfisher so Sinak, um do they all have the same call no and unfortunately no i can't play the call because i actually don't have the congo birds on my phone in terms of the bird calls so i've only got the south african ones um, and some of the kenyan ones so unfortunately i wouldn't be able to play that for you guys which is a shame because i would like for you to hear it um funny enough talking about kingfisher calls and kingfishers in congo the other kingfisher that we went to go and see there that is also a very special bird and, and hangs around more in the forest than anywhere else um, is called a chocolate back kingfisher and the way we found it was by listening to its call and we were walking along one afternoon and we were in a small group it was all the boys that were together and we went on this this epic walk through the forest and it was just really to go and see what we could find we weren't really looking for anything we were just whatever there was we would take it and um, we were walking along walking along and we heard this bird calling and one of the guys that was in our group who's an incredible birder um he said no it's a chocolate black kingfisher and and quite a few of us hadn't seen one so he said no we're going to try and find it and slowly but surely we tracked through this forest this kingfisher call and eventually high up in the canopy about i'd say 25 to 30 meters up we spotted these uh, chocolate back kingfishers that were calling and it was really tricky to see them there's a hippo that's displaying his best that he can at the moment lots of head shaking and big displays going on back there but it was really nice to have kind of found the, the those kingfishers and to find it in that way was awesome and then while we were sitting with this chocolate back kingfisher we then heard this telltale call of a guinea fowl now there it's not like here where helmeted guinea fowls run around all over the place the guinea fowls that are in the congo forest are very hard to find they run around and, and the congo forest is thick it's dense brush that you can't really see what's going on at all and you just hear this kind of guinea fowl call and it was the plumed guinea fowl this is the one that we heard calling and it then eventually went through and we could hear it calling hear it calling couldn't see it and it was close it was within sort of five meters and we were kind of like crawling through this undergrowth to try and get a view of it because the one guy that was with us was trying to get a photo so the very good birder that i was talking about a guy called adam he was trying to get a it's not adam that i normally talk about that's adam gama it's another adam um so we had two adams on the trip I know very very confusing and we had a Nikki and a Vicky so it was you know got a bit tongue-tied at times but anyway so we were crawling through this undergrowth and Adam really wanted a picture and it then kind of flew up this plumed guinea fowl and sat on this perfect little branch in a gap in the forest and there was this beautiful kind of green background and he managed to get a picture of it which was absolutely amazing and it was only there for about a second before it flew away and, and that was the only the glimpse we got of a guinea fowl in the in the days that we were there and we walked that forest from sunrise to sunset pretty much every single day so it gives you an idea of how lucky we were to actually see it so very very special and the birding in the Congo was unbelievable there were so many amazing things but there's our hippos are still having a bit of a play in the background there's lots and lots of bouncing around from some of the hippos you can see some of the wake in the background good we're gonna carry on kind of milling about we'll see if we can head off towards um, those leopards a little bit later but in the meantime we'll send you back across to David who's in the Mara and is still sitting I think with his lions well, the times as guides when we go out, we miss to see the big mammals or the big animals and we deal with small little birds or feathered friends as we call them and this is one of them and this one here is some sort of vulture, is a vulture rather and it's called a hooded vulture hooded vulture and it's only here for one reason just to wait until these lions are going to leave this kill and she can sneak in and start cleaning the savanna as is their main job. We call them our garbage collectors, but they do such a wonderful job. So, so long as this male is here, there's not much 
she is going to do. We earlier saw a whole bunch of them on top of a tree, or on top of a thorn tree. And this guy must have had, I don't know how many pounds, maybe 50, 60, 70 pounds of meat. And you can see how now he's punting with a very big belly and all those flies on her tummy. But he is about what? Just about under one meter, about three feet from the keel. He cannot see very far from it because they know they cannot trust the vultures. So yeah, that's about three feet more or less in that yeah that can be very itchy with all the flies there and this is one of the reasons why all the flies when they become a nuisance the spread have been known to climb the sausage trees well he's gonna be here and i've been waiting to see if his other brother will come because we are in the sausage republic now and the males that rule this area are called the old pike now, from where we are, the Kichwa males are quite a distance and they have a different territory. They have a different, the other coalition is of three and they're very close to the camp. Such a long way from Kubian, our plus, to the Olorola Pride. And that's where we usually see the Kichwa males of three. There's one called the Half Tail, there's another one called Fang, and there's a, th a third one. Now, these two here, we have not been able to give them names because, I mean, we call them the Oldonio Pike, but they don't have individual names because we think they must have overthrown Kipuli. We all know Kipuli, who got a clip like on his nose, and he got two other youngsters and they formed a coalition, but we do not know where they are. They could have gone to Serengeti or Tanzania. Tunisia, how are you? And you'd like to know the largest spread in the Mara. Number one, Tunisia in the Mara, we got over 10 prides in the Mara Triangle. Over 10. I won't give them names to you, but I'll give you one particular one here that we have because we have the sausage pride. Now, the largest is called the Olololo Pride. And I'm sure, Tunisia, you can say that after me. Olololo Pride, because we are making a song between me and Bungay and our verse will be all oh, lo, 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 lo. Anyhow, that particular pride has 16 members, one six, that's pretty large uh, pride. And we think there could be two new additions in that pride because the other day, it could be like five days ago, I saw one of the adult females in that particular pride and she looked big, she had a swollen belly, went away, and came back after a few days and I saw two small little cubs with that particular female. So if they are 16 plus those two, now we got 18. So that will be the largest pride in the Mara Triangle. Well, the sausage pride is trying to catch up because they got five females here without counting the males that come in and go. In a pride, we'll always count the females and the youngsters and they got three new cubs. Well, not new, they're four and three months old. So that makes eight. And of the two other females here, we got two that are pregnant. One of them is called Kinky Tail. And we think, or people, the viewers have been thinking she could be carrying three. So we might end up with 11. And if the other one allows to have another three, we might have 14, who knows? And they'll be catching up very much with the uh, Olololos, who knows? So we're just waiting to see. I've been hoping that these two girls in this pride will give us you know, new bundles of joy with the beginning of the year. Not yet. And you know, I think it's out of my excitement that I'm thinking she's late and she's still not due. It takes about, what, 100, 105 days to have the cabs. So we'll see what happens maybe the next few days. But I usually do as much as I can to swing around this area every other day to see whether I'll surprise myself with the new cabs. Well, that one just toast and turn around and then also turn around to South Africa to Jamie. Hello. We are back up and running, fingers crossed. So hopefully the problems that we were having with the vehicle have now been sorted thanks to our amazing tech team. And we are, well, we are now doing every single hyena den on Juma. We've just, I've just checked Aubrey's road. Nothing, definitely not active. They are, well that one tunnel's actually completely filled with dirt. So they're not in there. So I'm going back to 
check our well our assumption that they'd actually moved from Philemon's cut line. The nice thing is it's nice and cool this evening so there's a good chance that they will actually wherever they are they'll be there. How's that for a sentence? Wherever they are they'll be there. Wherever the den is the, there's a good chance the adults are there now because it's it, it's cold weather so they're not they're going to be coming back to the cubs early I hope. So we're going to go and check Philemon's cut line and then the one just south of that and I've checked everywhere else. I've checked Gallagher, I've checked Mbubu, I've checked so oh, Tristan was going to go past Zoe's. I wonder but I mean they haven't used Zoe's since 2015 to the best of my knowledge but you never know. And then there's that den that Gwen used on Cheetah Cutline. I don't think they're going to be at that den though. They were in our camp last night, so in fact all we really need to do is sit up through the night, wait for them to come and visit us, and then follow them back. Although I suspect it's Ribbon that's paying a nightly visit to the camp, which was always her in the past. That's what we should have done last night. Who needs sleep? We should have stayed awake and followed whichever hyena decided to come and investigate our camp tracks all the way through going up to people's doors sniffing around the bathrooms obviously hold some sort of fascination for them uh, someone's driven there that must have been Trist yeah maybe they maybe they've just become really hygienic they're gonna go and use our showers okay we're going to continue the search. Off you pop across to Sydney to see if his lines are feeling amorous. So look at how beautiful that male is like. You can see that now it's time for them to rest. So he's not doing anything at the moment, but all he has been doing was just watching and trying to investigate if there's any other animal coming. Maybe he's threatened a little bit by the scent of the other males from far. So you can see the female is just lying down flat behind those bushes. Sometimes it can be very difficult to see the lions when they're hiding behind these bushes. They can be so very camouflaged. They can blend easily with the surrounding. Uh, he is a very cute boy, you can see, but uh, Avokas, as a coalition, all the members of that coalition, they look very beautiful. If you look at this one, he's got very beautiful mane. The other one has got very beautiful eyes. So now let's quickly cross over to Tristan and see what is happening now. Well, indeed you are back with us and we're with one of my favorite things to follow around the Chitwa Dam. As some of you might remember from the p times that I've been at the dam, I often try and find these little guys and watch them go about their business. Now, this is, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's called the green-backed heron or striated heron is also its other name. Um, and they run along the edges and they look for fish and what they'll do is they'll slowly kind of move and they skulk about and then they get into little stalk mode much like a cat does and that's why I like them I think they are so fascinating to watch are you going to do a hunt for us it would be amazing if it does come on little one so they edge towards the water and then they watch and then they find a little fish and they'll kind of dart forward and then they extend that neck now the neck looks as though they don't have one it almost looks as though they're like uncle fester without a neck but actually what they will do is they'll shoot this long neck out and they'll kind of stab into these fish and grab them and then eat them and they're such fun to watch actually hunting i thoroughly enjoy watching these guys go about their business and it can be a kind of quite sort of end of your seat stuff when you watch them sort of sneaking up and they get, get themselves primed and almost like a leopard that bum wiggles a little bit and then that head shoots forward it's very cool to see now in the background you might be hearing a few different bird calls when there's 
a um, white-faced whistling duck that's calling, which I always love that call. It always reminds me that they it's summer around here. So there's the spoonbill that's kind of moving around. Now, sorry, Emma, I missed the name. I did get the question, but I have to apologize. I missed the name. I was not focused too well. D, so D-line. Oh, David, can you get to the heron quickly? It looks like it's going to go... The hippos in the background, sorry that I'm making a bit of noise, but D-line, um, no, I'm not sure if this is the smallest heron in the world, it's actually not as small as it looks, if it sits upright and has its neck up, it's actually quite big. Yes hippos, we hear you, we can hear you guys in the background, it's okay. Now it's edged closer, come on, are you going to shoot your neck out? There's too much noise going on. Now it sits dead patient and you wouldn't think you don't think that there would be fish in those shallows, but they are. They're trying to escape all the predatory fish within the system. So especially things like the catfish that swim around here, they'll eat all these little tiny fish. And so they try and get right up into the shallows where the catfish can't go. And yes, Emma, these hippos don't want to share the spotlight today at all. They, every time we try and show something, they start huffing and puffing and making all kinds of noise. Isn't this cool though? I think it's cool. I know that many of you just think that there's a bird staring at water, but it's in the hunt now, so it's trying to get itself kind of positioned and it's waiting. There we go. You see, it just starts to twitch a little bit. Almost shot out its neck. Now, I believe a lot of you are singing the Adams Family song in reference to my Uncle Fester kind of comment in the fact that this has got no neck. It doesn't quite look like Uncle Fester. It's a pretty bird, but it um, definitely kind of has that same build, doesn't it? It's all round with very small little legs, and I suppose if Uncle Fester had a beak they would be and a, a wig on, they would have a similar thing. I'm sure this bird doesn't like being called Uncle Fester, and, but it's too busy hunting for it to really care about what I've got to say about life. Anyway, oh, there we go, a little twitch again. I think it's waiting for, as the fish kind of get a little closer, it's just going to kind of, I suppose it's got to be the right moment every single time. Oh no, the foam has ruined it. You see the foam on the edge of the water has ruined its hunt. It's gone straight over the top where it was looking and maybe that spooked the fish. Fish don't like when things kind of go over the top of them. They get quite nervous and so I think the foam on the edge of the water, sorry little heron, has that disturbed everything? Oh wait, wait hang on, the croc is now chasing something as well. So the croc went after something, I don't know what it was, but it just went bolting. There, look, you see? What's it got? Oh, it's hunting fish as well. You see that? Do you see the fish jumping? That is crazy. So the crocs here hunt fish all the time. Um, they'll go after them regularly. And, and at the moment, their favorite little hunting spot is unfortunately not got any water in it. And so maybe that's why they're trying to hunt on the edge here when they see maybe catfish pushing up um, towards the, the shallows and the other fish kind of bubbling, they rush in. The other crocodile couldn't care at all. It was kind of unfazed by what just happened. But that croc rushed in very, very quickly to try and see and it was cool to see the fish kind of jumping out of the water and you'll see when they hunt like that every now and then it is very cool well lapwing you say bad day to be a fish but both these predators have been outsmarted at this point so the heron's got nothing the crocodile's got nothing and so you know so far the fish two predators zero at this stage which if you if i was a fish i would take those odds any day of the week if i'm honest i'd rather be on those odds than the other way around to be honest goes our hippos again. You can just hear the wind is also getting up a little bit. Anyway, unfortunately our heron has moved off now because of the foam, so it's not hunting anymore. So we're going to carry on. We're going to leave Chitwadam probably now. In the meantime though, back to the Masai Mara, to David. I think he's still sitting with the lions and I hope that they'll get up and do something soon. That could be such an exciting hunt, eh? Of a croc trying to get some sort of fish. Not sure what fish uh, should get either, you know, a uh, mudfish or a catfish. But anyhow, we are coming to my golden hour or my golden moment, and that's the western horizon. And to see the sun is slowly pushing away, heading home. And that could be marking the end of another lovely day here in the Mara. But as the sun goes home, we'll be getting other excitement because as we were watching earlier, we had this particular one male that has been feeding on this buffalo and in the particular grass there, in the bushes there, 
I saw another male that just stood up and he must have sat down somewhere there and you remember I was talking of a coalition of two males that we call the Ondonio Pike that we think are now uh, in charge of these girls here that we call the Sausage of Pride and I think he just went flat on the grass there it won't take long for him to come and I guess he'll come here that's why strategically I have not moved from who I am because you know also the females may show up and even if they don't this is where the food is this is where the kill is chances are they must all come for food at one point to have some dinner before it gets dark so what we want to do we'll just go back to our mill we'll show you how flat he is for a couple of minutes and then maybe decide to move away and see whether we could be lucky to find out where those cars are because I'm still very convinced they're not very far and if anywhere they moved they must have gone can you see them there there if you look carefully let's go back and get to that grass that's the boy I'm talking about he put his head up and that's the other member of the Olandonia Pike mill <coughs> excuse me and why he's not coming here I do not know and yes did you hear me please come over come join your brother or your little mate and you need to have to eat together and maybe we'll see how the one that just laying there uh, with the kill will react as soon as he gets here he's walking very slowly with a lot of confidence with a normal flick of tails for lions when they walk through the savannah grass of the Mara triangle and remember ladies and gentlemen should you have any questions or comments you may send them through hashtag safari live on twitter we love interacting with you in real time as you can see the belly also this oops can't even walk you are too full I was just about to say the belly of this and then he just confirmed what I wanted to say it's too heavy too full I need to walk a few steps stop and rest and yes you have every right and being that lazy I'm not sure I really want to go where you are I'm going to wait for you here until you come let's find out or compare this lazy boy who hid in the grass to Sydney's lions one space available so you can see that uh, our responsible male of this uh, female is now lying down and I can promise you now it's getting cold a little bit maybe they might wake up and move but they're not gonna move far as we have been here for quite a while now they have only moved for a distance which is less than 60 meters and 60 meters they have already mated three times so already they have mated three times so which means uh, if we can add more uh, more meters away from where they are they're still going to do the same I saw that every time the female is interested to move the male is going alongside her and try to bite her on the ear pushing her to go down and after doing that she's lying down on the ground and uh, things are happening so yesterday and few days ago the female is the one who was doing the dance now the female is not doing the dance a lot the male is the one who is pushing the female in order to mate So you can see that these animals Chris what a lovely question <clears throat> that question uh, is one of those very much important questions today when having this kind of a sighting if another male comes here whether big or small this male we are seeing lying down here is going to stand up and defend the female whether the lion is just passing by or is coming with the intentions of taking over there is going to be a very big fight this male lion doesn't want any other male to come near this female we are going to see a very big fight which can be vicious you can see he's got quite a lot of scratch marks already and I can promise you I don't think there's any other male which will be able to uh, challenge him here at this stage from what they have witnessed when he was challenging others but that, that does not mean if another male comes here he's not going to win the fight the thing is he has been uh, mating consecutively 
in a very short space. I'm sure he doesn't have much strength to challenge another fresh male who is coming from feeding. So you can see how he's sleeping. He's looking very much tired. And the females don't mind to mate with other males. So she can be able to mate with several males uh, from the very same Ostra circle. If the males are competing and some are winning, some are losing, she will just consider the winners. So now let's quickly cross over to Jamie and hear how she's doing. Okay, so this is the last active den site that we know of. It's the one just south of Philemon's cut line. And there's a track or two in the mud. And I've noticed while I've been sitting here, there are flies around the entrance to the den site itself. So I think there is a possibility that they're still here. There's something a little bit scuffed about that, although that could have just been washed in. It's really difficult to tell, and I'm not going to go stick my head down the entrance hole if there's potential for cubs in there. It would terrify the absolute daylights out of them. So we're not, we're not going to do that. We're not going to terrorize tiny hyena cubs. That's a little bit unfair. And so I think it is that we have to move on and just see what else we can find. I was hoping, I've just been sitting here for a minute just to wait and see whether or not there's any sign of movement or sound from within the den, but nothing. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where they've gone. It's going to be very difficult to find them if they haven't gone to one of their regular dens because it's so thick now. I wonder, is that, that's not the other den, that's a different termite mound. Oh well, onwards we go. We're going to go back and we're going to go round to where Tristan says he might have seen, or Dave might have seen, sorry Craig, watch out, um, might have seen a light coloured spot on a termite mound. You know, so we're really clutching at straws here when Tristan was racing to Hosanna. You never know. We'll take this route to Treehouse Dam and we'll see from there. <laughs> All right, while we do that, let's send you across to the man who let us know himself and find out if he thinks we'll get lucky with it. Well, good luck, Jamie. Uh, David only told me about the colored spot um, a, a while ago, and, and he, uh, not when we were actually there, and so we couldn't look and see what it was. I hope it wasn't that cheetah that we missed completely. Um, but we kind of just came past quickly where Hosanna's kill was, hoping he might be in the tree. He's not in the tree, unfortunately. We can't see where he is, so we're just going to carry on towards Tandy and Columba and back into that sighting now that we can. There's these little fruit marks, though. Always like seeing Hosanna's little pug marks. You can see them in the road. There we go. Very cool. He's got nice feet, doesn't he? Yes, we like our young lad. He's a very cool animal. And hopefully he's going to spend some time coming towards Tandy and Clalumba tonight. It will be very, very nice just now. So we're going to hopefully get a view of them. We're going to head off, like I say, hopefully have them on the kind of on the kill still. I don't know. I heard something about Tandy moving, but I didn't really kind of listen. I was too busy talking about hippos and stuff that I was at that stage missing what was happening. And so we'll just check and see. I'm hoping that she hasn't disappeared and that she's still here. I would be surprised if she left. Maybe she's gone to go and see what her delinquent half-brother has been up to and what he's doing so close to her. You know how she loves to have other leopards around. Tandy is always so grumpy when it comes to other leopards. She's always hissy and growly and snarly. So maybe she's going to go and sort her half-brother out. Right. Yes, it looks like Tandy's gone north of the road and little Clalumba is on this side of the road. So there's still vehicles here, but these are the last two vehicles that kind of have thought about coming and so it should be okay just to kind of slide in over here somewhere and to be able to see not very much given the 
way everybody's parked is going to be a bit tricky, unfortunately. Sorry, David. That's unfortunately what the visual we have. Um, so we're going to try and kind of wait and see if Tandy will move and come back or if little Clolumba will also kind of give us a better view of what's going on. But at least we still can see her a little bit kind of feeding on her carcass and they've eaten quite a bit of it already which is interesting because obviously we know that yesterday morning they were still finishing off a kill um, in Torchwood and so they must have been grazing this since last night so it must have happened during the course of the night or maybe early hours of this morning and they've eaten as much as they can out of it but it's interesting that they've kind of as little as there is left but right now little Columbia is feeding and she's grown and gotten big and is almost at that age where it can be difficult to call her a cub in fact we can't call her a cub really I suppose but it sounds like David up in the Mara well he's found little ones that are cubs and they are not spotty but rather tawny I think Tulamba could be going to about a year now in sense of age but now my cubs here are four months and three months and they just got to the dining table. Well number one you may notice the lighting has changed a little bit because it has got a little bit darker here in Kenya in the Mara Triangle and now we are using an infrared camera. Pretty special camera it got some invisible light to the animals but we can see them very well so got in dark here and you have changed to infrared which does not show the actual real colors that you know of that are familiar with you of the lions and of course the grass this grass is very green because of the rains we have been having and now we got the other male that just came in and another female came in and the three cubs came in so I think my bet was fair and made a lot of sense Leon, how are you? And you'd like to know what's the gestation period of lions? It's about 100, 105 days. So shortly after three months, you'll get a mother uh, or a lioness popping up either one or two or three cubs. In certain cases, we have seen four cubs, but it's about an average of 100 to 105 days. Now, this one's uh, the two pair, the two sets of cubs here, are two of the same age, about four months, and this one, which is that particular one there, that's about three months old and they're of different mothers. I do not know where they were and I told Bungay the best thing you got to do is to stick here and stay put and wait. So long as there's food they will come back. Either they had gone for a drink and because this kill is barely 48 hours old there's still a lot of meat in it. And you can see that small little guy there trying to climb on top. Not sure whether he knows how big those ribs are or maybe what his parents went through. Jennifer, Cubbies, yes, I'm very happy, Jennifer, you're enjoying all this. And I was trying to compare the size of that big male uh, lion there and that small little cub there and the buffalo looking at those two sizes in proportionality to the small cub. Not sure what's going on. Let's just listen for a second. Now, the other male that just came in, they have formed a very formidable coalition. And these two, we'll call them the Old Donya Pike. And we think they are the ones that overthrew the Kipuli and the two youngsters. See the cubs under the male there. You can hear all the rumbling there and all the vocals sound they're making and because I've always thought lions do not have very good table manners as they eat. This is a great sighting and I think my day has been made today and anytime I say you see lions it's always a great day and I haven't seen these spells for a couple of days. I don't know where they have been, but I think they're back in action. The cubs seems to be doing pretty well. And talking of cubs, it's also reminding me of Talamba in Juma. Very nice leopardess to see her coming or taking shape. And maybe she'll be in the future. 
you know, queen of that area once her mother is gone. Yes, Laura, it's a nice way for us or for these lions to end up getting their dinner. Thank you so much, Laura, for such a nice comment. And I'm just feeling a little tempted to get hungry. Well, well done, Jamie. Well done, Sydney. Well done, Tristan, South Africa. Lions, Tralamba. And also well done myself here uh, with Bungay for having gotten the sausage tree pride. And it's such a good way to end a drive. So I want to thank all of you for having been on board. And I'm sure you all know we'll be out here again tomorrow morning to bring you such glorious wilderness. Thank you so very much. And from the African wilderness and most of the Mara Triangle, we are saying thank you again and goodbye.